Happy Monday! Today we are going to read Chapter 11, The Dueling Club. Harry woke up on Sunday morning to find the dormitory blazing with winter sunlight and his arm reboned but very stiff. He sat up quickly and looked over at Colin's bed, but it had been blocked from view by the high curtains Harry had changed behind yesterday. Seeing that he was awake, Madame Pomfrey came bustling over with the breakfast tray and then began bending and stretching his arm and fingers. All in order, she said as he clumsily fed himself porridge left-handed. When you're finished eating, you may leave. Harry dressed as quickly as he could and hurried off to Gryffindor Tower, desperate to tell Ron and Hermione about Colin and Dobby, but they weren't there. Harry left to look for them, wondering where they could have got to, got to and feeling slightly hurt that they weren't interested in whether he had his bones back or not. As Harry passed the library, Percy Weasley strolled out of it, looking in far better spirits than last time they'd met. Oh, hello, Harry, he said. Excellent flying yesterday. Really excellent. Gryffindor has just taken the lead for the House Cup. You earned 50 points. You haven't seen Ron or Hermione, have you, said Harry. No, I haven't, said Percy, his smile fading. I hope Ron's not in another girl's toilet. Harry forced a laugh, watching Percy walk out of sight and then headed straight for Moaning Myrtle's bathroom. He couldn't see why Ron and Hermione would be there in there again, but after making sure that neither Filch nor any prefects were around, he opened the door and heard their voices coming from a locked stall. It's me, he said, closing the door behind him. There was a clunk, a splash, and a gasp from within the stall, and he saw Hermione's eye peering through the keyhole. Harry, she said, you gave us such a fright. Come in. How's your arm? Fine, said Harry, squeezing into the stall. An old cauldron was perched on the toilet, and a crackling from under the rim told Harry they had lit a fire beneath it. Conjuring up a portable waterproof fires was a specialty of Hermione's. We've come to meet you, but we just... We'd have come to meet you, but we decided to get started on the polyjuice potion, Ron explained as Harry with difficulty locked the stall again. We decided this is the safest place to hide it. Harry started to tell them about Colin, but Hermione interrupted. We already know. We heard Professor McGonagall telling Professor Flitwick this morning. That's why we decided we better get going. The sooner we get a confession out of Malfoy, the better, snarled Ron. Do you know what I think? He was in such a foul temper after the Quidditch match, he took it out on Colin. There's something else, said Harry, watching Hermione tearing bundles of knotgrass and throwing them into the potion. Dobby came to visit me in the middle of the night. Ron and Hermione looked up, amazed. Harry told them everything Dobby had told him, and hadn't told him. Hermione and Ron li listened with their mouths open. The Chamber of Secrets has been opened before, Hermione said. This settles it, said Ron in triumphant voice. Lucius Malfoy must have opened the chamber when he was at school here, and now he's told and now he's told dear old Draco how to do it. It's obvious. Wish Dobby told told you what kind of monster's in there, though. I want to know how come nobody's noticed it sneaking around the school. Maybe it can make itself invisible, said Hermione, prodding leeches to the bottom of the cauldron. Or maybe it can disguise itself, pretend to be a suit of armor or something. I've read about chameleon ghouls. You read too much, Hermione, said Ron, pouring dead lace wings on top of the leeches. He crumpled up the empty lace wing bag and looked at Harry. So Dobby stopped us from getting on the train and broke your arm, he shook his head. You know what, Harry? If he doesn't stop trying to save your life, he's going to kill you. The news that Colin Creevy had been attacked and was now lying as though dead in the hospital wing had spread through the entire school by Monday morning. The air was suddenly thick with rumor and suspicion. The first years were now moving around the castle in tight-knit groups as though scared they would be attacked if they ventured far forth alone. Jenny Weasley, who sat next to Colin Creevy in charms, was distraught, but Harry felt that Fred and George were going the wrong way about cheering her up. They were, they were taking turns covering themselves with fur or boils and jumping out at her from behind statues. They only stopped when Percy, apoplectic with rage, told them he was going to write Mrs. Weasley and tell her Ginny was having nightmares. Meanwhile, hidden from the teachers, a roaring trade in talismans, amulets, and other protective devices was sweeping the school. Neville Longbottom bought a large, evil-smelling green onion, a pointed purple crystal, and a rotting newt tail before the other Gryffindor boys pointed out that he was in no danger. He was a pureblood, 
and therefore unlikely to be attacked. They went for Filch first, Neville said, his round face fearful, and everyone knows I'm almost a squib. In the second week of December, Professor McGonagall came around as usual, collecting names of those who would be staying at school for Christmas. Harry, Ron, and Hermione signed her list. They had heard the Malfoy, that Malfoy was staying, which struck them as very suspicious. The holidays would be the perfect time to use the polyjuice potion, potion and try to worm a confession out of him. Unfortunately, the potion was only half finished. They still needed the bicorn horn and the boom slang skin, and the only place they were going to get them was from Snape's private stores. Harry privately felt he'd rather face Slytherin's legendary monster than let Snape catch him robbing his office. What we need, said Hermione briskly as Thursday's afternoon, afternoon's double potion lesson loomed near, is a diversion. Then one of us can sneak into Snape's office and take what we need. Harry and Ron looked at her nervously. I think I'd better do the actual stealing, Hermione continued in a matter-of-fact tone. The two, you two will be expelled if you get into any more trouble, and I've got a clean record. So all you need to do is cause enough mayhem to keep Snape busy for five minutes or so. Harry smiled feebly. Deliberately causing mayhem in Snape's potion class was about as safe as poking a sleeping dragon, dragon in the eye. Potions lessons took place in one of the large dungeons. Thursday afternoon's lessons proceeded in the usual way. Twenty cauldrons stood steaming between the wooden desk on which stood brass scales and jars of ingredients. Snape prowled through the fumes, making waspish remarks about the Gryffindor's work while the Slytherin sniggered appreciatively. Draco Malfoy, who was Snape's favorite student, kept flicking puffer fish eyes at Ron and, her and Harry, who thought that if they retaliated, they would get detention faster than you could say unfair. Harry's swelling solution was far too runny, but he had his mind on more important things. He was waiting for Hermione's signal, and he hardly listened as Snape, as Snape paused to sneer at his watery potion. When Snape turned and walked off to bully Neville, Hermione caught Harry's eye and nodded. Harry ducked swiftly down behind his cauldron, pulled one of Fred's filibuster fireworks out of his pocket, and gave it a quick prod with his wand. The firework began to fizz and sputter. Knowing he had only seconds, Harry straightened up, took aim, and lobbed it into the air. It landed right on target in Goyle's cauldron. Goyle's potion exploded, showering the whole class. People shrieked as splashes of the swelling solution hit them. Malfoy got a face full, and his nose began to swell like a balloon. Goyle blundered around, his hands over his eyes, which, he had, expand, which had expanded to the size of a dinner plate. Snape was trying to restore calm and find out what had happened. Through the confusion, Harry saw Hermione slip quietly into Snape's office. Silence! Silence! Snape roared. Anyone who had been splashed, come here for the deflating drought. When I find out who did this... Harry tried not to laugh as he watched Malfoy hurry forward, his head drooping with the weight of a nose like a small melon. As half the class lumbered in Snape's desk, up to Snape's desk, some weighted down with arms like clubs, others unable to talk through gigantic puffed-up lips, Harry saw Hermione slide back into the dungeon, the front of her robes bulging. When everyone had taken a swig of antidote and the various swellings had subsided, Snape swept over to Goyle's cauldron and scooped out the twisted black remains of the firework. There was a sudden hush. If I ever find out who threw this, Snape whispered, I shall make sure that person is expelled. My phone keeps ringing. Harry arranged his face into what he hoped was a puzzled expression. Snape was looking right at him, and the bell that rang ten minutes later could not have been more welcome. He knew it was me, Harry told Ron and Hermione as they hurried back to Moaning Marble's bathroom. I could tell. Harry threw the new ingredients into the cauldron and began to stir feverishly. It'll be ready in two weeks, she said happily. Snape can't prove it was you, said Ron reassuringly to Harry. What can he do? Knowing Snape, something foul, said Harry as the potion frothed and bubbled. A week later, Harry, Ron, and Hermione were walking across the entrance hall when they saw a small knot of people gathering around the notice board reading a piece of parchment that had been just pinned up. Seamus Finnegan and Dean Thomas beckoned them over, looking excited. They're starting a dueling club, said Seamus. First meeting tonight. I, could, I wouldn't mind dueling lessons. They might come in handy one of these days. What, you reckon Slytherin's monster can duel, said Ron? But he, too, read the sign with interest. Could be useful, he said to Harry and Hermione as they went to dinner. Shall we go? 
Harry and Hermione were all for it, so at eight o'clock that evening they hurried back to the Great Hall. The long dining tables had vanished, and a gold stage had appeared along one wall, lit by thousands of candles floating overhead. The ceiling was velvety black once more, and most of the school seemed to be packed beneath it, all carrying their wands and looking excited. I wonder who'll be teaching us, said Her Hermione, as she as they edged into the chattering crowd. Someone told me Flitwick was a dueling champion when he was young. Maybe it'll be him. As long as it's not, Harry began, but he ended on a groan. Gilderoy Lockhart was walking onto the stage, resplendent in robes of deep plum and accompanied by none other than Snape, wearing his usual black. Lockhart waved an arm for silence and called, Gather round, gather round. Can everyone see me? Can all of you hear me? Excellent. Now, Professor Dumbledore was granted, has granted me permission to start this little dueling club to train you all in case you ever need to defend yourselves, as I myself have done on countless occasions. For full details, see my published works. Let me introduce my assistant, Professor Snape, said Lockhart, flashing a wide smile. He tells me he knows a little, tiny little bit about dueling himself and has sportingly agreed to help me with a short demonstration before we begin. Now, I don't want any of you youngsters to worry. You'll still have your potions, Master, when I'm through with him. Never fear. Wouldn't it be good if they finish each other off? Ron, Ron muttered in Harry's ear. Snape's upper lip was curling. Harry wondered why Lockhart was still smiling. If Snape had been looking at him like that, he'd have been running as fast as he could in the opposite direction. Lockhart and Snape turned to face each other and bowed. At least Lockhart did. Let's see. Which made twirl, uh, let's see. Lockhart and Snape fate turned to face each other and bowed. At least Lockhart did, with much twirling of his hands, whereas Snape jerked his head irritably. Then they raised their wands like swords in front of them. As you see, we are holding our wands in the accepted com combative position, Lockhart told the silent crowd. On the count of three, we will cast our first spells. Neither of us will be aiming to kill, of course. I wouldn't bet on that, Harry murmured, watching Snape baring his teeth. One, two, three. Both of them swung their wands above their heads and pointed them at their opponent. Snape cried, Expelliarmus, Expelliarmus. I can't say it, but they say it. There was a dazzling flash of scarlet light, and Lockhart was blasted off his feet. He blew, back, he blew backward off the stage, smashing into the wall, and slid down into the sprawl on the floor. Malfoy and some of the other Slytherins cheered. Hermione was dancing on tiptoes. Do you think he's all right? She squealed through her fingers. Who cares, said Harry and Ron together. Lockhart was getting unsteadily to his feet. His hat flat had fallen off and his wavy hair was standing on end. Well, there you have it, he said, tottering back into the platform. That was a disarming charm. As you can see, I've lost my wand. Ah, thank you, Miss Brown. Yes, an excellent idea to show them, Professor Snape, but if you don't mind my saying, it was very obvious what you were about to do. If I had wanted to stop you, it would have been only too easy. However, I felt it would be instructive to let them, let them see. Snape was looking murderous. Possibly Lockhart had noticed because he said, Enough demonstrating. I'm going to come amongst you now and put you all into pairs. Professor Snape, if you'd like to help me. They moved through the crowd, matching up partners. Lockhart teamed Neville with Justin Finch Fletchley, but Snake reached Harry and Ron first. Time to split up the dream team. Let's pull off my hair. Time to split up the dream team. Hello. I think he sneered. Weasley, you can partner with Finnegan. Potter? Harry moved automatically towards Hermione. I don't think so, said Snape, smiling coldly. Mr. Malfoy, come over here. Let's see what you make of the famous Potter. And you, Miss Granger, you can partner with Miss Bulstrode. Malfoy strutted over, smirking. Behind him walked a Slytherin girl who reminded Harry of a girl of a picture he'd seen in Holidays with Hags. She was square and large, and her heavy jaw juttered, jutted aggressively. Hermione gave a weak smile that she did not return. Face your partners, called Lockhart back on the platform, and bow. Harry and Malfoy barely inclined their heads, not taking their eyes off each other. Wands at the ready, shouted Lockhart. When I count to three, cast your charm to disarm your opponents, only to disarm them. We don't want any accidents. One, two, three. Harry swung his wand high, but Malfoy, Malfoy 
Malfoy had already started on two. His spell hit Harry so hard he felt as though he'd been hit over the head with a saucepan. He stumbled, but everything still seemed to be working and wasting no more time. And wasting no more time, Harry pointed his wand straight at Malfoy and shouted, Rick Stimpra. A jet of silver light hit Malfoy in the stomach and he doubled over, wheezing. I said disarm only, Lockhart shouted in alarm over the heads of the battling crowd as Malfoy sank to his knees. Harry had hit him with a tickling charm and he could barely move from laughing. Harry hung back with a vague feeling it would be disporting to bewitch Malfoy while he was on the floor, but this was a mistake. Gasping for breath, Malfoy point pointed his wand at Harry's knees, choked Terran Tangtalagra, and the next second Harry's legs began to jerk around out of his control in a kind of quick step. Stop, stop, shouted Lockhart, but Snape took charge. Finit incantatum, he shouted. Harry's feet stopped dancing, Malfoy stopped laughing, and they were able to look up. A haze of greenish smoke was hovering over the scene. Both Neville and Justin were lying on the floor panting. Ron was holding holding up an ashen-faced Seamus, apologizing for whatever his broken wand had done, but Hermione and Millicent both strode were still moving. Millicent had Hermione in a headlock, and Hermione was whimpering in pain. Both their wands lay forgotten on the floor. Harry leaped forward and pulled Millicent off. It was difficult. She was a lot bigger than he was. Dear, dear, said Lockhart, skittering through the crowd, looking up the aftermath of the duels. Up you go, Maximilian. Careful there, Miss Fawcett. Pinch it hard. It'll stop bleeding in a second. Boop. I think I'd better teach you how to block unfriendly spells, said Lockhart, standing flustered in the midst of the hall. He glanced at Snape, whose black eyes glinted, and looked quickly away. Let's have a volunteer pair. Longbottom and Finch Fletchley, how about you? A bad idea, Professor Lockhart, said Snape, gliding over like a large and malevolent, malevolent bat. Longbottom causes devastation with his simplest spells. We'll be sending what's left of Finch Fletchley up to the hospital wing in a matchbox. Neville, Neville's wrong pink, round pink face went pinker. How about Malfoy and Potter, said Snape with a twisted smile. Excellent, said Lockhart, gesturing Ron and Malfoy in the middle of the hall as the crowd backed away to give them room. Now, Harry, said Lockhart, when Draco points his wand at you, you do this. He raised his own wand, attempted a complicated sort of wiggling action, and dropped it. Snape smirked at, as Lockhart quickly picked it up, saying, Oops, my wand's a little overexcited. Snape moved closer to Malfoy, bent down, and whispered something in his ear. Malfoy smirked, too. Harry looked up nervously at Lockhart and said, Professor, could you show me that blocking thing again? Scared, muttered Malfoy so that Lockhart couldn't hear him. You wish, said Harry out of the corner of his mouth. Lockhart cuffed Harry merrily on the shoulder. Just do what I did, Harry. What, drop my wand? But Lockhart wasn't listening. Three, two, one, go, he shouted. Malfoy raised his wand quickly and bellowed, Serpensortia. The end of his wand exploded. Harry watched aghast as a long black snake shot out of it, fell heavily onto the floor between them, and raised itself ready to strike. There were screams at the crowd back as the crowd backed swiftly away, clearing the wand. Clearing the floor, excuse me. Don't move, Potter, said Snake lazily clearing, enjoying the sight of Harry standing motionless, eye to eye with the angry snake. I'll get rid of it. Allow me, shouted Lockhart. He brandished his wand at the snake, and there was a large, large, a loud bang. The snake, instead of vanishing, flew ten feet into the air, flew back to the ground with a large, loud smack. Enraged, hissing furiously, it slithered straight towards Justin Finch Fletchley and raised itself again, fangs exposed, poised to strike. Here he wasn't sure what made him do it. He wasn't even aware of, de even aware of deciding to do it. All he knew was that his legs were carrying him forward as though he was on casters and that he had shouted stupidly at the snake, leave him alone. And miraculously, inexplicably, the snake slumped to the floor, docile as a thick black garden hose, its eyes now on Harry. Harry felt the dr fear drain out of him. He knew the snake wouldn't attack anymore, anyone now, though how he knew it he couldn't have explained. He looked up at Justin grinning, expecting to see Justin looking relieved or puzzled, or even grateful, but certainly not angry and scared. What do you think you're playing at, he shouted, and before Harry could say anything at all, Justin had turned and stormed out of the hall. Snape stepped forward, waving his wand, and the snake vanished in a small puff of black smoke. 
Snake, too, was looking at Harry in an unexpected way. It was a shrewd and calculating look, and Harry didn't like it. He was also dimly aware of an ominous muttering all around the walls. Then he felt a tugging on the back of his robes. Come on, said Ron's voice in his ears. Come on, move. Ron steered him out of the hall, Hermione hurrying alongside them. As they went through the doors, the people on either side drew away as though they were frightened of catching something. Harry didn't have a clue what was going on, and neither Ron nor Hermione explained anything till they had dragged him all the way up to the empty Gryffindor common room. Then Ron pushed Harry into his armchair and said, You're a parcel mouth? Why don't you tell us? I'm a what? said Harry. A parcel mouth, said Ron. You can talk to snakes. I know, said Harry. I mean... That's only the second time I've ever done it. I accidentally set a boa constrictor on my cousin Dudley at the zoo once. Long story, but it was telling me it had never seen Brazil, and I sort of set it free without meaning to. That was before I knew I was a wizard. A boa constrictor told you it had never seen Brazil, Ron repeated faintly. So, said Harry, I bet loads of people here can do it. Oh, no, they can't, said Ron. It's not a very common gift. Harry, this is bad. What's bad, said Harry, trying, starting to feel kind of angry. What's wrong with everyone? Listen, if I hadn't told that snake not to attack Justin. Oh, that's what you said to do to it? What do you mean? You were there. You heard me. I heard you speaking parcel tongue, said Ron. Snake language. You could have been saying anything. No wonder Justin panicked. You sounded like you were egging the snake on or something. It was creepy, you know? Harry gave to him. I spoke in a different language, but I didn't realize... How can I speak a language without knowing I can speak it? Ron shook his head. Both he and Hermione were looking as though someone had died. Harry couldn't see what was so terrible. Do you want to tell me what's wrong with stopping a massive snake biting off Justin's head? He said. What does it matter how I did it as long as snake, as Justin doesn't have to join the headless hunt? It matters, said Hermione, speaking at last in a hushed voice, because being able to talk to snakes was what Sathazar Slytherin was famous for. That's why the symbol of Slytherin House is a serpent. Harry's mouth fell open. Exactly, said Ron. And now the whole school's going to think you're his great-great-great-grandson or something. But I'm not, said Harry with a panic he couldn't quite explain. You'll find that hard to prove, said Hermione. He lived about a thousand years ago. For all we know, you could be. Harry lay awake for hours that night. Through a gap in the curtains around his four-poster, he watched snow starting to drift past the tower tower window and wondered, could he be a descendant of Sathazar Slytherin? He didn't know anything about his father's family, after all. The Dursleys had always forbidden questions about his wizarding relatives. Quiet, quietly, Harry tried to say something in parcel tongue. The words wouldn't come. It seemed to, he had to be face to face with the snake to do it. But I'm in Gryffindor, Harry thought. The sorting hat wouldn't have put me here if I had a Slytherin blood, if I had Slytherin blood. Ah, said a nasty little voice in his brain, but the sorting hat wanted to put you in Slytherin, don't you remember? Harry turned over. He'd see Justin the next day in Herbology, and he'd explain that he'd been calling the snake off, not egging it on, which he thought angrily pummeling his window. Any fool should have realized. By next morning, however, the snow had begun in the night and turned into a blizzard so thick the last Herbology lesson of the term was canceled. Professor Sprout wanted to fix socks and scarves on the mandrakes, a tricky operation she would entrust to no one else. Not that it was so important for the mandrakes to grow quick now that it was so important for the mandrakes to grow quickly and revive Mrs. Norris and Colin Creedy. Harry fretted over the, this next to the fire in the Gryffindor common room, while Ron and Hermione used their time off to play a game of wizard chess. For heaven's sake, Harry, said Hermione, exasperated, as one of Ron's bishops wrestled her knight off his horse and dragged him off to the board. Go and find Justin if it's so important to you. So Harry got up and left through the portrait hall, wondering where Justin might be. The castle was darker than it usually was in daytime because of the thick, swirling gray snow at every window. Shivering, Harry walked past classrooms where lessons were taking place, catching snatches of what was happening within. Professor McGonagall was shouting at someone who, by the sound of it, had turned his friend into a badger. Resisting the urge to take a look, Harry walked on by, thinking that Justin might be using his free time to catch up on some work, and decided to check the library first. A group of the Hufflepuffs, who should have been Herbology, were indeed sitting at the back of the library, but they didn't seem to be working. Between the long lines of high bookshelves, Harry could see that their heads were close together and they were having what looked like an absorbing conversation. He couldn't see whether Justin was among them. He was talk walking toward them when someone, something, 
He was walking toward them when something of what they were saying met his ears, and he paused to listen, hidden, hidden in the invisibility section. So anyway, a stout boy was saying, I told Justin to hide up in his dormitory. I mean to say, if Pot Potter's marching down at his next victim, it's best if he keeps a low profile for a while. Of course, Justin's been waiting for something like this to happen ever since he let slip to Potter he was muggle-born. Justin actually told him he'd be down for it. And that's not the kind of thing you, you bandy about your Slytherin's heir on the loose, is it? You definitely think it's Potter then, Ernie said a girl with blonde pigtails anxiously. Hannah, said the stout boy solemnly, he's a parcel mouth. Everyone knows that's the mark of a dark wizard. Have you ever heard of a de de decent one who could talk to snakes? They called Slytherin himself Serpent Tongue. There were some heavy mutterings at this, and Ernie went on. Remember what was written on the wall? Enemies of the air, beware. Potter had some sort of run-in with Filch. Next thing we know, Filch's cats attacked. That first year, Creevy was annoying Potter at the Quidditch match, taking pictures of him while he was lying in the mud. Next thing we know, Creevy's been attacked. He always seems so nice, though, said Hannah uncertainly. And, well, he's the one who made you know who disappear. Can't be all that bad, can he? Ernie lowered his voice mysteriously. The Hufflepuffs bent closer, and Harry edged closer, nearer so he could catch Ernie's words. No one knows how he survived the attack by you-know-who. I mean to say, he was only a baby when it happens. He should have been blasted into smithereens. Only a really powerful dark wizard could have survived a curse like that. He dropped his voice until it was barely made a whisper and said, That's probably why you know who wanted to kill him in the first place. Didn't want another dark, dark lord competing with him. I wonder what other powers Potter's been hiding. Harry couldn't take it anymore. Clearing his throat loudly, he stepped out from behind the bookshelf. If he hadn't been feeling so angry, he would have found the sight that greeted him funny. Every one of the Hufflepuffs looked as though they had been petrified by the sight of him, and the color was draining out of Ernie's face. Hello, said Harry. I'm looking for Justin Finch Fletchley. The Hufflepuffs' worst fears had clearly been confirmed. They all looked fearfully at Ernie. What do you want with him, said Ernie in a quivering voice. I wanted to tell him what really happened with that snake at the dueling club, said Harry. Ernie bit his white lips and then took a deep breath and said, we were all there. We saw what happened. Then you noticed that after I spoke to it, the snake backed off, said Harry. All I saw, said Ernie stubborn, stubbornly, though he was trembling as he spoke, was, was you speaking parcel tongue and chasing that snake toward Jason, to, towards Justin. I didn't chase it at him, Harry said, his voice shaking with anger. It didn't even touch him. It was a very near miss, said Ernie, and in case you're getting ideas, he added hastily, I might tell you that you can trace my family back to the nine generations of witches and warlocks, and my blood's as pure as anyone's, so I don't care what sort of blood you've got, said Harry fiercely. Why would I want to attack Muggleborns? I've heard you hate those muggles you live with, said Ernie swiftly. It's not possible to live with the Dursleys and not hate them, said Harry. I'd like, you to, I'd like to see you try it. He turned on his heel and stormed out of the library, earning himself a repro reproving glare from Madame Pence, who was polishing the gilded cover of a small, ugh, a large spell book. Harry blundered up the corridor, barely noticing where he was going. He was in such a fury. The result was that he walked into something very large and solid, which knocked him backward onto the floor. Oh, hello, Hagrid, Harry said, looking up. Hagrid's face was entirely hidden by the woolly, snow-covered the Lakalava, I don't know, but it couldn't possibly be anyone else as he filled most of the corridor in his moleskin overcoat. A dead rooster was hanging from one of his massive gloved hands. All right, Harry, he said, pulling up the Lakalava so he could speak. Why aren't you in class? Canceled, said Harry, getting up. What are you doing here? Hagrid held up the limp rooster. Second one killed this term, he explained. It's either foxes or a blood-sucking bugbear, as I need the headmaster's permission to put a charm around the hen coop. He peered more closely at Harry from under his thick, snow-flecked eyebrows. You sure you're all right? You look all hot and bothered. Harry couldn't bring himself to repeat what Ernie and the rest of the Hufflepuffs had been saying about him. It's nothing, he said. I better get going, Hagrid. It's Transfiguration next, and I've got to pick up my books. He walked off, his mind still full of what Ernie had said about him. Justin's been waiting for something like this to happen ever since he let slip to Potter he was muggle-born. Harry stamped up the stairs and turned along, with, along another corridor, he was particularly, which was particularly dark. The torches had been extinguished by a strong, icy draft that was blowing through a long window pane. 
He was halfway toward the passage when he tripped headlong over something lying on the floor. He turned to squint at what he'd fallen over and felt as though his stomach had dissolved. Justin Finch Fletchley was lying on the floor, rigid and cold, a look of shock frozen on his face. His eyes stared blankly at the ceiling, and that wasn't all. Next to him was another figure, the strangest sight Harry had ever seen. It was nearly headless Nick, no longer pearly white and transparent, but black and smoky, floating immobile and horizontally, six inches off the floor. His head was half off, and his face wore an expression of shock identical to Justin's. Harry got to his feet, his breathing fast and shallow, his heart during, doing a kind of drum roll against his ribs. He looked wildly up and down the deserted corridor and saw a line of spiders scuttling as fast as they could away from the bodies. The only sounds were the muffled voices of teachers in the classes on either side. He could run, and no one would ever know he had been there, but he couldn't just leave them lying there. He had to get help. Would anyone believe he hadn't had anything to do with this? As he stood there, panicking, a door right next to him opened with a bang. Peeves the poltergeist came shooting out. Why, it's Potty Wee Potter, cackled Peeves, knocking Harry, Harry's glasses askew as he bounced past him. What's Potter up to? Why is Potter lurking? Peeves stopped halfway through the mid-air somersault. Upside down, he spotted Justin and nearly had the snake. He flipped the right way up, filled his lungs in before Harry could stop him, screamed, Attack! Attack! Another attack! No mortal or ghost is safe! Run for your lives! Attack! Crash! 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 Door after door flew open along the corridor and people flooded out. For several long minutes, there was a scene of such confusion that Justin was in danger of being squashed and people kept standing in nearly headless neck. Harry found himself pinned against the wall as the teacher shouted for quiet. Professor McGonagall came running followed by her own class. One of them still had black and white striped hair. She used her wand to set up a loud bang, which restored silence and ordered everyone back into their classes. No sooner had the scene cleared somewhat when Ernie the Hufflepuff arrived, panting at the scene. Caught in the act, Ernie yelled, his face stark white, pointing his finger dramatic at Harry. That will do, Macmillan, said Professor McGonagall sharply. Peeves was bobbing overhead, now grinning wickedly, surveying the scene. P Peeves always loved chaos. As the teachers bent over Justin and nearly had a snake examining them, Peeves broke into song. Oh, Potter, you rotter, oh, what have you done? You're killing off st students, you think it's good fun. That's enough, Peeves, barked Professor McGonagall, and Peeves zoomed away backward with his tongue out at Harry. Justin was carried off to the hospital wing by Professor Flitwick and Professor Sinistra of the astronomy department, but nobody seemed to know what to do with nearly headless snake. In the end, Professor McGonagall conjured a large fan out of thin air, which he gave, she gave to Ernie with instructions to waft nearly headless snake up the stairs. This, er this Ernie did, fanning Nick along with a silent black hovercraft. This left Harry and Professor McGonagall along together. Alone together. This way, Potter, she said. Professor, said Harry at once, I swear I didn't. This one's out of my hands, Potter, said Professor McGonagall curtly. They marched in silence around a corner, and she stopped before a large and extremely ugly stone gargoyle. Lemon drop, she said. This was evidently a password, because the gargoyle sprang suddenly to life and hopped aside as the wall behind him split in two. Even full of dread for what was coming, Harry couldn't fail to be amazed. Behind the wall was a spiral staircase that was moving smoothly upward like an escalator. As he and Professor McGonagall stepped onto it, Harry heard the wall thud close behind them. They rose upward in circles, higher and higher, until at last slightly dizzy. Harry saw a gleaming oak door ahead with a brass knocker in the shape of a griffin. He knew now where he was being taken. This must be where Dumbledore lived.